Christopher Black from Canada. Mm. You studied politics, you studied law, you became an international criminal lawyer, and you took part in international tribunal of for for Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Yes. Uh, you have some problems today. That's we are, why we are meeting also at some secret place yeah. in the car. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, well, because of the sensitivity of the trial of President Milosevic, uh, we got followed by intelligence people from different agencies in NATO, and that caused a lot of anxiety. Uh, but in the Rwanda tribunal, there are a series of death threats from the Rwandan government, Tanzanian government, American government, CIA, uh, which followed me here just two years ago. The Canadian intelligence service visited me and told me that I was my life was in danger here, and uh, that I should. Well, actually, they, they <laughs> warned me to keep my my mouth shut about what I was talking about, basically, in order to be safe. Uh, Local police told me I should uh, probably get out of Toronto, which is what I did. And uh, so for me to be interviewed in public places or obvious places is a bit, uh, a bit of a, causes me some anxiety, so it's better this way. Mm -hmm. Let's start the story with the year 1994. It was when a genocide happened in Central Africa in Rwanda until today that is a very very important uh, event because all interventions happening afterwards were always justified with the fact look one million innocent Tutsi were slaughtered in Rwanda so right. the West has to protect human rights and democracy that's right in Kigali, der Hauptstadt von Rwanda, herrschen Chaos und Gewalt. Grund ist der Mordanschlag auf den Präsidenten und seinen Amtskollegen aus der Nachbarstadt Burundi. Die beiden Politiker kamen in der vergangenen Nacht ums Leben, als die Präsidentenmaschine mit Raketen beschossen wurde. Bei den daraufhin ausgebrochenen schweren Unruhen wurden unter anderem UN-Beobachter getötet und Politiker verschleppt. Am Abend hieß es, auch die Ministerpräsidentin sei ermordet worden. In Ruanda toben weiter schwere Kämpfe um die Hauptstadt Kigali. Die Bemühungen der Vereinten Nationen, einen Waffenstillstand zwischen Rebellen und Regierungstruppen zu vermitteln, sind vorerst gescheitert. In Kigali nimmt das Morden kein Ende. Auch heute wurde in der Hauptstadt von Ruanda wieder gekämpft. Bisher sollen über 20.000 Menschen umgekommen sein. Die beiden Völker der kleinen Zentralafrikanischen Republik, die Hutus und die Tutsis, fallen übereinander her. Sie sprechen die gleiche Sprache und sind äußerlich kaum voneinander zu unterscheiden, doch das hindert sie nicht. Eine trügerische Idylle, der Oberlauf des Kongo bei Kisangani. Zwischen dieser Biegung des großen Flusses und den tausend Hügeln von Ruanda sind in den vergangenen Jahren etwa zwei Millionen Menschen auf gewaltsame Weise umgekommen. Und das Morden geht weiter. Aber in dieser globalisierten Welt unserer Tage, wo angeblich alle Menschen gleich sind, ist es offenbar nicht dasselbe, ob man im World Trade Center von Manhattan oder in einer Strohhütte der kongolesischen Ostprovinz ums Leben kommt. Das soll kein moralisierender Vorwurf sein, sondern nur die Feststellung, dass der ganze afrikanische Kontinent von den Medien als Randphänomen behandelt zum wehrlosen Objekt ausbeuterischer Finanzinteressen geworden ist. Das Herz der Finsternis. Der legendäre Kriegsreporter und Analyst Peter Scholatur hat die Massenmorde in Zentralafrika Mitte der 90er Jahre sehr dramatisch, sehr anschaulich und sehr realistisch dargestellt. Und er hat nicht nur hier immer wieder davor gewarnt, die Berichte in der Systempresse für bare Münze zu nehmen. Doch so weit wie der kanadische Völkerrechtler Christopher Black 
der vor dem Arusha-Tribunal einen Hutu-General gegen den Vorwurf des Völkermords erfolgreich verteidigt hat, ist Peter Schollatur nie gegangen. Black sagt, nicht die Tutsi seien massenhaft niedergemetzelt und Opfer eines Genozids geworden, sondern tatsächlich die Hutu-Mehrheit. Ursache, so Black, sei darüber hinaus nicht der uralte Völkerhass, sondern die verdeckte Einmischung der USA gewesen. What did you have to do with this subject? Uh, well, I was engaged to defend one of the senior generals of the Rwandan Armed Forces at that time. He was the head of the National Police, but was also the highest ranking military officer in Rwanda. And I soon learned in defending him that in fact, there weren't one million Tutsis killed, but maybe one million Hutus killed. Um, there were Tutsis killed, of course, so people killed on both sides, but there it, it became quite clear through the trials, which lasted 14 years, that there was no plan by the government to exterminate Tutsis. The government didn't try to exterminate Tutsis, they tried to protect them. Tutsis and Hutus, it's two different tribes. Yes, in... there are three tribes actually in Rwanda. Tutsis, about 14% of the population, Hutus, about 85%. And there were the Twa, like a pygmy people, but only about one or two percent. So when the Tutsi forces from Uganda attacked Rwanda in 1990 uh, and then were defeated but then began using terrorist tactics for four more years against the government of Rwanda they slaughtered thousands and thousands and thousands tens of thousands of Hutus in very horrible ways so there was a Hutu government and Tutsi rebels Yes, well, they called themselves Tutsi rebels, but in fact, they weren't rebels. They were invading forces from Uganda, and all those rebel forces were members of the Ugandan National Army. Hmm. And President Kagame himself was a major general, or was, uh, sorry, was a head, deputy head of Ugandan Army Intelligence. Well, Uganda is a neighboring country of right. Rwanda. Hmm? So they, they invaded in 1990. The local Tutsis, uh, some welcomed that, some opposed it. Uh, the government at that time was... Um, under President Haberi Amana, but the Americans and French forced them under this attack to give up their one-party semi-socialist state for a multi-party Western-style democracy, which is what he did in 1992. From 1992 uh, onwards, then the government was no longer a Hutu government. It was a mixed government, Tutsis and Hutus, and then Tutsis and RPF people actually controlled senior um, key cabinet posts including the three prime ministers. The pre three prime ministers from 1991 through 94 were all sympathetic to the RPF, invading forces. And uh, so you cannot say it was a Hutu government any longer. In 1993, there was a general ceasefire agreed to. The UN sent forces in to protect that ceasefire. And then there were supposed to be elections held after that so people could freely choose who they really want. But the invading RPF forces and the Americans and Canadians and Belgians who supported them realized that they could never win the elections, that the majority of people would still vote for the same people they had before. So they decided to uh, uh, attack. And on April 6, 1994, they shot down the president's plane. They murdered the president of Rwanda, who's a Hutu. They murdered the president of Burundi, next door country, who is also a Hutu. The army chief of staff. So it was a decapitation strike. Okay, but um, and we UN heard in the media that uh, it was Hutu extremists downing that plane. Wer hat dieses Flugzeug abgeschossen? Wer tötete dabei am 6. April 1994 den Präsidenten von Ruanda? Juvenal Hapiariamna, der dem Volk der Hutu angehörte, hatte eben eine Politik der Versöhnung mit den Rebellen vom Volk der Tutsi beginnen wollen. Sie waren in einem ersten französischen Gutachten als die Täter bezeichnet worden. Der angebliche Tutsi-Anschlag auf das Leben des Hutu-Präsidenten wurde zum Auslöser für den schlimmsten Völkermord nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. 16 Jahre nach dem ersten Gutachten hat der französische Ermittlungsrichter Marc Trevedic noch einmal bei Null angefangen und durch ballistische Berechnungen herausgefunden, die Bodenluftrakete muss aus dem Lager der Regierungstruppen abgefeuert worden sein.
Dazu erklärt der Anwalt des heutigen ruandischen Präsidenten Kagame, der damals zu den des Präsidentenmordes beschuldigten Rebellen gehörte, die Expertise bestätigt die Annahme, dass die Rakete aus dem Militärlager Kanombe abgeschossen wurde, wo Regierungstruppen stationiert waren. Also Putsch der eigenen Leute, den wohl seine Versöhnungsabsichten mit den Tutsi missfielen. Der französische Antiterrorismusermittler Jean-Louis Bruguère hatte 2006 die Tutsi-Rebellen als Täter angesehen und Haftbefehle für mehrere enge Mitarbeiter des damaligen Rebellenführers und heutigen Präsidenten Kagame ausgestellt, was die Beziehung Ruandas zu Frankreich arg belastete. Den neuen Annäherungsversuchen dürfte das neue Gutachten französischer Experten Auftrieb verleihen. That was it's also yeah. written like that in Wikipedia still, I see. Oh, that's terrible. Yes, because that's not completely false. It's quite clear the RPF shot down that plane. We have all... Which is a Tutsi militia from Uganda. Right, yeah. they shot down the plane along with... Then, and the evidence is they had help from Belgians and from the Canadian General Dallaire. Um, he did some things to help them shoot down the plane. The missiles were assembled in a hangar, which a warehouse rented by the CIA. So all these Western countries were involved. And then the plane... So it's a false flag operation. Yes. They shot mm -hmm. down the plane. And then to make, it, to make the government look, that, look bad, they said, oh, Hutu extremists shot down their own president. Well, why would they do that? <laughs> it's just stupid. Anyway, we have the radio intercepts where Kagame, the day after the plane was shot down, sent out a broadcast in Swahili to his forces in the field saying, uh, we've shot, we've killed the president, we're going to win the war. We have the help of the Belgians and somebody else. Uh, they, that, we put that in, into evidence. We had um, investigators like Michael Hurrigan, an Australian lawyer, who was an investigator for the prosecutor was told to investigate the shoot down by Louise Arbor, the Canadian um, jurist, uh, the Canadian prosecutor. He found out that in fact it was the RPF that shot down the plane. He spoke to the people involved. He had documents and orders and proof. He told Louise Arbor that in fact I found out who shot down the plane. It was the RPF. She invited him to go to The Hague to deliver the information. It was on a disc. And she, then he was told to kill the investigation, and she seized that disc and kept it secret. So Louise Arbor covered up the fact that the RPF shot down that plane, and therefore she's, in my view, an accomplice to a mass murder, because there were 25 people on that plane, I think, 20, 25 people on that plane. And that was the first massacre of 1994, was done by the RPF. The same night that the plane went down, they attacked across the country. They lost their final offensive. They attacked in Kigali. They attacked across the north of the country. Um, they attacked the presidential guard barracks, they attacked the military police barracks and wiped it out, they attacked gendarme barracks and wiped out one. And then from that day on, they were bombarding the city with machine guns and heavy artillery uh, for three more months until the Rwandan army just ran out of ammunition. They only surrendered because they ran out of ammunition and they retreated into the Congo. And that's how Kagame took power. And he got help from the Americans. There was. Witnesses observed American C-130 Hercules, American Air Force C-130 Hercules, dropping men and supplies to the RPF forces in that period. Uh, the Belgians and other units which controlled the, had entrenched positions in the hills around uh, Kigali gave them over to the RPF so they could dominate the city from those heights. Mount Jali, Mount Ribeiro, Mount um, Kigali. They just handed them over with water, medical supplies, logistics, radios, ammunition. They just put it in there, then they walked away, the RPF walked in. You talk about Americans, Canadians, Belgians, French. Mm. What is so interesting about Rwanda? Is there, well, there are no minerals and resources, right? No. Well, actually, the French weren't there. The, just one little thing. The French left Rwanda in 1993 because the RPF didn't like the French so the, and the Americans. They, they asked them to leave. They left about six months before. So there were no French there aside from a couple of people at the embassy. There are a lot of Belgian advisors there. But no, Rwanda is not important in and of itself. It's just a very small country. But it's the doorway to the Congo, to Zaire. From there you can access it. You can and and uh, we produced a letter. We found a letter in my trial from Kagame to another Tutsi. Kagame leader. was the leader of RPF? Yes, he was the leader of the RPF. And today president of Rwanda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We found a letter dated August 1994 
uh, which was kept secret by the UNHCR, UN Human Rights Commission, uh, uh, Refugee Commission, sorry. They had a letter in their files which we found from Kagame to a politician in Burundi, a Tutsi politician, saying that the Hutus are in the way, our plan for Zaire is still in effect, but the Hutus are in the way. Once they're out of the way, we can, we can put our plan for Zaire into effect. And, this, and, we don't, and don't worry, my brother, because we have the help of the British, Belgian, and American intelligence services. That's what the letter says. It doesn't mention anything about a genocide taking place or anything like that. So uh, when I found that letter and produced it in the trial, they accused me of forging this letter. August 1994 is after all those events. It was just one month after. Mm. Yeah, one month after. So this letter is dated August 1994, um, and it's talking about the plan for Zaire. Well, what was the plan for Zaire? The plan for Zaire is exactly what took place. In 1996, two years, a few months later, they attacked Zaire and said they were attacking the refugee camps of Hutus there. In fact, they used that as an excuse to go in and divide up the Congo and create chaos so they could, because the Americans wanted to break Congo into three pieces. They wanted to keep Katanga the east. They wanted to keep that where the many minerals are. They wanted to break that away from Congo and then loot it and just have mining companies come in without paying any royalties. And that's what's basically happened. It was also the last days of President Mobutu's era. Yeah. They wanted to get rid of Mobutu because Mobu although Mobutu was put in by the Americans after they, uh, Lumumba was assassinated. They Many put, years before. Yeah, mm. 1960, they put Mobutu in power and he was their puppet in Zaire, in Congo. But the last few years before this, Mobutu began making deals with the Chinese for mineral contracts, for mining contracts, and the Americans didn't like that. So they wanted him gone. And they had asked the Rwandan government permission to use Rwanda as a base to launch an attack on Mobutu to kick him out, and they said no. So the it Ameri was the former Hutu government. Right. So they said no, and then the Americans said okay. They went looking for someone else to help them, and that's the Tutsis in Uganda and Museveni and his boys. It's the president of Uganda. Yeah. So they, he, they agreed, look, we'll help you take back power in, in, in um, Rwanda if you help us then uh, uh, invade uh, Congo for us as proxy forces. That's, what, that's what's happened ever what since. What is it about? Diamonds, gold? Coltan, all the minerals that go into your cell phone and cameras and computer parts, all are only found in rare amounts there. Gold, tons of gold, diamonds, uranium, everything is in Congo. Mm -hmm. Plus timber and all sorts of other reserves, you know, water, hydroelectric. I mean, there's all sorts of resources in that country. It's huge. One of the richest areas in the world, yeah, I can say. It's, it's what, 50 million people? I mean, people in Congo should all be very wealthy. Each one of them should be very wealthy. It's good. But, but they're, they're opposite all is the case. The opposite mm -hmm. is the case. So that's the, the threat. And, and there's also, in a way, a war between America and France for control of Central Africa because the, the Americans succeeded in kicking the French out of Central Africa. Um, it's not, the stories by the RPF that France is involved in the so-called genocide are all nonsense, complete nonsense, it never happened. Colonial power used to be Belgium, right? The colonial power is Belgium, not France, and, Bel and, Bel and it's quite clear the Belgians helped the RPF um, mm -hmm. take back, take power. But we all remember these pictures of mountains of dead bodies mm -hmm. lying around, yeah. it was said they were mm -hmm. killed with some swords and sticks and yeah, knives. Right. Uh. Genau 20 Jahre nach Beginn des Völkermordes in Ruanda kämpft der ostafrikanische Staat immer noch mit der Aufarbeitung des Genozids und dessen Folgen. 1994 wurden mehr als 800.000 Angehörige der Tutsi Bevölkerungsgruppe von regierungsnahen Hutu Milizen niedergemetzelt. So who are these people if you say there wasn't any genocide against Tutsi? Mm. Yeah, most of those dead bodies, I'm not saying Tutsis weren't killed, but most of those dead bodies are Hutus. We had RPF officers told, told us they killed one to two million Hutus in those 12 weeks. Now, the population in, of Rwanda in 1994 was about, I forget, four or five million people. The number of Tutsis was, we, we had the last census. The last census was taken in 1991. And the RPF never objected to the census. That census indicates that there were 595,000 Tutsis in Rwanda. That's it, 595,000. 
They now state that 300 or 400,000 Tutsi survived. So, who are all those dead bodies? They're all Hutus. And at Gashosi, they show 250,000 skulls, they say, or dead Tutsis from Kigali. Well, the only the, the number of Tutsis in Kigali, by the, according to the census, were 40,000 people. Um, General Dallaire said that on April 15th, he saw the RPF take out 14,000 Tutsis from Kigali into RPF lines. That reduces it down to 26,000. Uh, Bernard Kushna went to Kigali in late May of 1994 and talked to Tutsi leaders, and there were still 20,000 Tutsis alive and then protected. No more killings of Tutsis in Kigali at that time, if they ever took place. So we're missing like 6,000 people mm -hmm. in Kigali. So this, the, 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 200, the mountain of skulls you're seeing, which they say were people killed in, uh, Tutsis killed in Kigali are actually Hutus. Mm -hmm. We had a, one witness named, um, uh, what's his name now? Ak Sorry, I've forgotten his name. Um, anyway, a, a Tutsi, a very, a, one of the last members of the royal family um, came to testify, a Tutsi prince, very famous man, an artist, and he testified that he was in Kigali at that time he said the army and the gendarmerie never killed anybody. They tried to protect everybody. He said nobody, nobody was massacring Tutsis. And they, he said they never hurt me. What about this Interahamwe? Ah. In Hotel Rwanda, the movie, for example, the was, we all saw... Yeah, the uh, Interahamwe were a, a youth group attached to the MRND party, which was a sort of a semi-socialist party. And they were created... When they created a multi-party system in 1992, the parties that came up, the Liberal Party, Social Democratic Party and so on, were mainly front parties for the RPF forces. They created youth groups to try and recruit more members. So the MRND, in response, created the youth group also to try and recruit new members to its party. And they were called the inter and and it just means we joined together or something. Uh, there were only 1,500 members of that. We had their... and they were headed... the president of the inter was a Tutsi, the treasurer of the inter was a Tutsi. They had many Tutsi members. So the inter we had, they testified at our trial, these head of the, of the inter Now, uh, yeah, there's a witness named 006 who was the treasurer, who's now living in Canada under RCMP protection, who testified there were only 1,500 members of the inter There were Most of them were in Kigali. There was nobody outside Kigali. And yet every killing which they attribute uh, any, any Tutsi kill, they say, was killed by inter -Armway, no matter where it took place. And it became quite clear over time that the reason they did this was to discredit the MRND party so it could never take part in any elections ever after. And they've been banned, that party. So they say to, to, to break, because the MRND party was the most popular party in, in Rwanda. 80% of the people would have voted for that party. But by saying that its youth group murdered all these people, it, they're not only discredits, discredits the youth group, it discredits the entire party. So they said, you see, this party is a party of savages. So it, it's been banned. And that's what they used to justify that. So every killing by anybody, even if it's by bandits, is said to be by inter -Harmway. And it's impossible. We asked witnesses, they say in their testimony, oh, some inter killed this person, this person. Well, why do you say they're inter -Harmway? Well, everybody, that's just the word we use for anybody that killed anybody. They, they told us that's inter -Armway. Were there any extra inter members in your area? No, because our area is all, we all belong to other parties. So you, they're not really inter -Armway. No, not really, but we we're told to use that word. Mm -hmm. but Mr. Black, we know this American movie, uh, Hotel Rwanda. Mm -hmm. Mein Name ist Paul Rusesse Bagina. Ich bin der Manager des luxuriösesten Hotels in der Hauptstadt Ruandas. Einer Stadt, die für mich und meine Familie eine glückliche Heimat war, bis zu dem Tag, an dem sich alles änderte. Papa, da sind Soldaten auf der Straße. Als über Ruanda der Wahnsinn hereinbrach, sie töten die Kinder der Tutsi, um die nächste Generation auszulöschen, Nein. wandte sich die Welt ab. 
Wieso greifen Sie nicht ein? Hunderttausende werden sterben. Man hat uns im Stich gelassen. Auf Rettung brauchen wir nicht zu hoffen. Wir können uns nur selbst retten. Runter, runter! Die wahre Geschichte eines Mannes, der das Unmögliche wagte. Ich kann diese Menschen nicht sterben lassen. Nein, lass uns nicht im Stich! Um jeden zu retten, den er retten konnte. Man wird behaupten, Sie hätten die Massaker befohlen. Dann werden Sie Ihnen die Wahrheit sagen. Ich werde nichts sagen, wenn Sie mir nicht helfen. Er fand einen Ort, Geht alle ins Hotel. wo die Hoffnung überlebte. Du bist ein guter Mensch. Hotel Ruanda. In that movie we can see how some so-called Interahamra guy speaks through the radio to kill all no, Tutsi. No, that's never happened. That never happened. In fact, uh, Hotel Rwanda is fiction because the, the manager of the hotel was made the hero of the film. He was the manager of the hotel, but he didn't do anything. The hotel was protected by uh, Rwandan army, by UN people, and by gendarmes. Mm -hmm. They protected that hotel. And... So he, he, he didn't protect people. He was just a manager there. The, the, but the police and the army surrounded the hotel because there were Tutsi families in there and they protected them. And there were UN officials in there. They were protected. And in cooperation with General Dallaire and the UN. At the time, everybody knew that hotel was being protected by the UN and by the, lo and the local police and the army. They were never attacked there. Uh, they accused Radio RTLM, which was a private radio station in which many Tutsis had shares, by the way. <laughs> It was because it was a private, people had shares in this radio station, um, including Tutsis. Uh, they said they were putting out propaganda or killed Tutsis. That's not what they said. The reason they attacked RTLM was the same as they're attacking RT and Sputnik and all these other uh, Russian outlets is because they're actually saying what was going on. RTLM would say, you know what? The RPF is saying this and this, but we know they're planning to attack. We know that they're 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 planning something else, and that's what they didn't like. And that's and so they put out this stuff about them. Oh, they're inciting people to kill. That's not true. But there was on the RPF side a station called Radio Mohabura. Radio Mohabura was financed by the British Army and uh, British government, and it was putting out, it was transmitting messages. To, Uh, very horrible things about Hutus, they, they're savages, they don't deserve to rule Rwanda. It was, I mean, you get the transcripts from Radio Murhabura and you'll see what, <laughs> how terrible and racist they were. So RTLM was another example of them spinning the story upside down. So black becomes white, white becomes black. You know, the good guys are the bad guys, the bad guys are the good guys. That's what they've done in this whole story. And Yeah, the claim by President Clinton that the Americans did nothing in Rwanda, so you see what we did, if we don't do anything, this is what happens, is a complete lie, the big lie, because President Clinton was involved in helping the RPF start that war, and the final offensive in which the RPF killed maybe one to two million Hutus. Civilians, really? Yeah, they mm -hmm. killed them, and they killed them in very horrible ways. In February 1993, there was a ceasefire, which had been agreed to. The RPF broke that ceasefire and they attacked the town of Ruangari. They occupied that town for two weeks. They killed 40,000 Hutus in those two weeks before the army took that town back. 40,000 in mass graves. They killed them with hoes. They skinned them alive. They cut the right. You wouldn't believe what we heard. That is proven? Yes, in the testimony in the trials, but the press doesn't repeat it. Hmm. The BBC followed those trials. All the major press outlets followed those trials. They're in the court every, a courtroom every day. And yet all we saw them report was what the prosecution said. When we proved something else, never heard about it. Mm. You said we because you were a lawyer in an international tribunal right. in uh, Tanzania. What, right. uh, can you tell us something about... Well, the tribunal was set up in 1995 along with the Hague Tribunal for Yugoslavia around the same time by the same people. And you soon found out that, in fact, we had RPF intelligence officers come and tell us, testify in the trial, returned and fled the regime and said to the judges, you don't know what you're, what you're doing. You know what? Every department in this tribunal is, is, has RPF agents in it and CIA and other Western intelligence agents. The first woman, the person I met, the first day I arrived there to take my case was a very attractive, tall American woman who identified herself as an American Air Force colonel, and she was a lawyer too. She was in charge of the prosecutions. I asked her, why, 
The Americans say they don't have anything to do with Rwanda. So why are you in charge of the prosecution, an American Air Force colonel in charge of the prosecutions here? She says, well, why do you want to know? I said, because I think you have guys helped shoot down the plane. She said, well, you, you'll never prove that. But uh, you find out very quickly that the staff, uh, the controlling staff were Americans, Canadians, British. And a lot of them were working for intelligence services of those countries. The same at the Hague Tribunal. And the prisoners even had lists of defense lawyers who they thought were agents sent in to help them, but get them to plead guilty, work on their heads and psychologically and convince them you should plead guilty. You can't win this case, you should plead guilty. Uh, it was about Hutu militaries who were blamed to yeah, have well, they committed the, mass murder? The tribunal, they, they were very interesting how they selected the accused. They selected mayors, Hutu mayors, burgmesters. They selected prefets, like governors. Um, high officials, cabinet people, uh, military officers, intellectuals, musicians. Any, if you're a Hutu intellectual, or they, that's what they picked. So they tried to make it look like the entire Hutu population were evil. So we had a Bikindi, who was a musician. He, wasn't, he was even in London. He wasn't even in Rwanda at the time. They accused him of massacre. He wasn't even there. And he proved it. We had the passport. <laughs> uh, priests. They, they, they had a cross section, they chose a cross section of the Hutu society and, and then picked people and just charged them to give the picture that the entire Hutu society was to blame for all these Tutsi dead, when in fact most of the dead were Hutus. Um, and there, there wasn't, I'll not say there weren't, and there was, so there were Tutsis killed by Hutus. Some were killed by bandits, some killed for personal reasons, some killed, but most. Hutus who killed Tutsis did it out of fear. We heard witnesses testify. I'll give you one example. One man testified who did kill Tutsis, said he was a young guy. And he said, in our village, south of Kigali, there was no hatred between the Tutsis and Hutus. We, uh, my, Tutsis, my girlfriend was a Tutsi. We liked to. We got along well. We had, the war to us was up in the north. It was a big power thing. It had nothing to do with ordinary people. And then one day, April 19th, we woke up and all the Tutsis in town were gone. And we wondered, where is everybody? And somebody said, you know what? They're all down at the local church. What are they doing there? So we went down and there's like 2,000 Tutsis there or so. All gathered and we said, we asked them, shouting, what, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Why? And then somebody said, you know what? They must have got a message from the RPF to clear out and keep here because they're going to attack us. And they want to know where the Tutsis are so they don't kill them. They're going to and then what and then people began throwing stones they threw stones back at us there was some fighting fist fighting and so on that was all for about two days third day he said six guys came from a, a refugee camp of hutus down a few miles away and they had some weapons and they said the rpf forces just took two towns south of here and they've killed every hutu in those towns everybody we just fled from there they're coming they're going to kill you all and they said they did the same thing in those towns. The Tutsis gathered in the local churches so they knew where the Tutsis were. Then they, they attacked the rest of the city, the town, and they wiped all the... They're killing everybody. They're massacring them. These guys are going to kill you too. They're helping kill you. And they said, we're going to... Like, why don't you attack them? They said, well, they're our friends. Well, not to us. And they began firing at them. And then he said some people joined in. Some people were shocked and said nothing. Some ran away. He said, it was just like a nightmare. He says, that's what happened. People killed because they were afraid, not because they hated Tutsis and wanted to wipe out Tutsis, because they thought they were going to get wiped out by them. That's not genocide, that's war. And somebody's responsible for that. Who did you defend in this that tribunal? I defended uh, a man named General Augustin Dindiliamana, who was the uh, chief of staff of the gendarmerie, the national police. He used to be the senior minister, defense minister, an advisor to President Habir Yamana. Was he sentenced? No, he was acquitted of all charges. And in fact, he was considered one of the moderate Hutus, so-called. And uh, he was, his wife's a Tutsi, his children are part Tutsi. Uh, his entire military escort were Tutsis. I mean, the, what people don't remember or know is that the Rwandan army had Tutsis in it. The gendarmerie, the national police had Tutsis, many Tutsis. Uh, my gen the guy I defended, his entire close protection team were all Tutsis. And in fact, he uh, gave them to some hotel to protect some Tutsi families. Uh, 
So the idea that it was a Hutu government attacking uh, Tutsis to wipe them out because they wanted to wipe out Tutsis is bizarre, it's stupid, it's not it's wrong. Still he was 14 years in jail, right? Yeah. So why that? Ah, uh, it's quite clear that they, they brought him down to um, force him to testify. They wanted him to testify against Colonel Bagasora, we think. And they brought him down to put pressure on him. If you testify against Bagasora, we'll let you go. And he refused to do that. So they had him in prison. Now they had to find a reason to keep him in prison. So they just invented all these charges. And it's quite clear they invented all these charges. And the proof of that is not just my say-so, because in the judgment, if you read the judgment in my trial, the judges actually said that Mr. Black said all through the trial that these charges were politically motivated and were, were false. Uh, we have come to the conclusion that he was correct. So that's the judges said that. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you read the trial transcripts, anybody wants to do that, you'll find out why they came to that conclusion, that the charges were all fake, the massacres, we proved that massacres they said took place never took place, never occurred. There was one at uh, college, they said there were like 600, uh, no, sorry, 100 or 200 Tutsis were killed in this college. In fact, nobody was killed there, nobody at all. Um, and so, but the press keeps repeating these stories. You see in the press always every April, and every story about Rwanda. As you know, 800,000 Tutsis were killed. It's always 800 to a million Tutsis. Well, there weren't that many. It was only 595, and they're, mm. how come they're all still alive? I remember when I was traveling Africa uh, in 2009, mm. also Rwanda. I met a German journalist in Kenya, mm. and she said she loves Kagame so much because she, she is so democratic. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Rwanda myself, I saw a developed country, good infrastructure, people having jobs. Mm. Uh, it is peaceful. So can't we say whatever happened in the past, uh, but President Kagame now is a good guy, a good politician for that country? Well, no, because uh, before he came, entered the country in 1990, Rwanda was already considered the Switzerland of Africa. It was one of the most advanced countries in Africa, even though it was one of the poorest. It had one of the best electrification, rail, uh, sorry, road systems, health care systems, education systems. And then in four years of war, Kagame's forces destroyed all that. They destroyed everything. Uh, so now it's taken 20 years for Kagame to bring it back, and I doubt very much that the common peasant is any better off than they were than under the government before. Sure, they got some high-rise buildings, makes Kigali look a bit more modern, but uh, democracy they don't have. I mean, uh, Hutus can't uh, be freely elected. Uh, they got Victoire and Gabiri. Any, any political opposition is arrested, and detained, murdered. Their murder has been taking place for the last 20 years. Political uh, people who are political opposition to Kigali. Many officers have fled his regime and testify that he was the one that shot down the plane, that they're the ones that committed all the massacres, they're all assassinated. My investigator was kidnapped in Nairobi last year, we heard he was tortured in the Kigali prison. They put out death threats on me. They sent a death a team to London last or two years ago to kill people. The Scotland Yard kicked them out. There was rumors that they were sending a hit team here to kill me and four other people just last year. Um, so no, Kigali can't claim anything, and all the riches, all the stuff you see in Kigali, is produced from what? From his forces going in and looting the Congo, and that's his reward from the Americans and British. You go in, we'll give you something. But the, there's nothing for the common people. Uh, there are no real opposition parties. The RPF always wins. They claim all well, women have equality and they're represented in the parliament, but there are no Hutu women. It's mainly Tutsis. So. And they suppressed the Hutu population. They got 100,000 people still in jail. 
almost every family, Hutu family in, in Rwanda has somebody in jail. So they control the population that way. You're not allowed to talk about what happened in the war. You're not allowed to say that Tutsis killed you or the RPF killed my family. You're thrown in prison or you're killed. You disappear for that. No, you cannot say Kagami is a good man. Forget the past. It's all over. Reconciliation. That's nonsense. This guy's a mass murderer. He's killed millions. And he's killed like maybe two million in Rwanda and, and ten, maybe ten, maybe more million in, in Congo. His forces machine gunned people in a river at Tingi Tingi. Tens of thousands machine gunned. Chased him across the Congo forest. The guy is, 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 he's killed more people than maybe, well, he's one of the mass murderers of history, this guy. So, so what? He's got a couple of fancy hotels in Kigali, so what? It means nothing. The guy is uh, a war criminal and should be charged. And there should be, the Arusha Accords should be put in place, which is that there should be free and fair elections where everybody can participate. He's never followed that. He will never follow that. He'll stay in power forever until the Americans don't want him anymore. And then they'll remove him. When, they, when he no longer serves their purpose, they'll put somebody else in. That's how it works. During the 90s, not only Central Africa was a place of massacres, but also Southeast Europe, mm. the former Yugoslavia. Mm. Um, you advised former Yugoslavian president Slobodan Milosevic, who was blamed for mass murder in those wars. Mm -hmm. Are you a lawyer of the devil? <laughs> no, I, mean, I don't say I'm a lawyer of the angels, but uh, I defend people who I have defended people, including Milosevic, who were not guilty of anything they've been charged with. Milosevic was a politician, a socialist politician. Uh, he had his faults, but he is not guilty of anything, any of the crimes they alleged against him. In fact, that's why he was murdered in the prison later in 2006, in March 2006. You think it was murder? There's no doubt about it. He wrote a letter to the Russians that he was being poisoned. Uh, in the, the circumstances of his death are very strange. and. The, even the internal uh, ICTY report, the Parker report, they found two mysterious drugs in his body, rifampicin and uh, an anesthetic. And they can't explain the presence of those drugs in his body. And it was quite clear that the trial collapsed as soon as it started. They had no evidence against him because it was all nonsense. Uh, he was destroying them, making them look like the, what they were, the war criminals. They are the aggressive state, not, not Yugoslavia. So they, if they couldn't acquit him, because if they acquitted him, he would go back to Yugoslavia, Serbia, as a hero. And he a big, big, dominant politician again. And then the entire justification for the war, the attack on Yugoslavia, would collapse, because the excuse was him. In 1989, Serbia's leader, Slobodan Milosevic, the same leader who started the wars in Bosnia and Croatia and moved against Slovenia in the last decade, stripped Kosovo of the constitutional autonomy its people enjoy. And in the center of it all, a dictator in Serbia who has done nothing since the Cold War ended but start new wars and pour gasoline on the flames of ethnic and religious division fully. Secretary Albright has worked tirelessly for a negotiated agreement. Mr. Milosevic has refused. If President Milosevic will not make peace, we will limit his ability to make war. Hopefully, Mr. Milosevic will realize his present course is self-destructive and unsustainable. If he decides to accept the peace agreement and demilitarize Kosovo, NATO has agreed to help to implement it with a peacekeeping force. If we and our allies were to allow this war to continue with no response, President Milosevic would read our hesitation as a license to kill. There would be many more massacres, tens of thousands more refugees, more victims crying out for revenge. Liebe Mitbürgerinnen und Mitbürger, heute Abend hat die NATO mit Luftschlägen gegen militärische Ziele in Jugoslawien begonnen. Damit will das Bündnis weitere schwere und systematische Verletzungen der Menschenrechte unterbinden und eine humanitäre Katastrophe im Kosovo verhindern. Der jugoslawische Präsident Milosevic führt dort einen erbarmungslosen Krieg. Wir führen keinen Krieg. Aber wir sind aufgerufen, eine friedliche Lösung im Kosovo auch mit militärischen Mitteln durchzusetzen. But in fact, that wasn't the reason. And if they released him, that's what would happen. And yet they could not convict him because there was no evidence against him. So he was eliminated.
and okay. the trial was shut down. So who killed all those people in Bosnia and in the Kosovo? There was a civil war. I mean, many people are killed on both sides. It was a civil war provoked by the Germans and the British and the, and the Americans for all. They wanted to break Yugoslavia up. When you break Yugoslavia up, civil war results. And that's what. Who's responsible for the civil war? But I'm. But uh, the attack on Yugoslavia in 1999 was uh, was bogus. I mean, the, the excuses to attack Yugoslavia about massacres of uh, Albanians and Kosovo is just nonsense. Absolute nonsense. And he proved that in the trial. And many people testified to that effect. So uh, I didn't defend the devil at all. I defended a man who I thought was, and I still think, and everybody knew him, was a sincere and honest man. When I first met him in Belgrade Central Prison, I asked him, he didn't know who I was, but I explained who I was. And I had, my first question to him was, why do you think you were arrested? And he said, uh, he laughed, and he said, I'll tell you two reasons. The first one is I'm a communist, and the second is I told the Americans to go fuck themselves. That's why I'm in here. And all the guards laughed and clapped, because that's why I, they all felt. Uh, and he never saw his family again. His family had to flee, go to Moscow. They, they can't go back to Serbia, because they put a puppet regime in there. and They can't go back safely. So no, it's uh, I didn't defend any devils. I mean, I defend who I'm asked to defend, and uh, if it turns out that's what they are, fine. But in the case of Rwanda and in the case of Milosevic, they were people who were being used as scapegoats for the crimes of the West. That's what they, that's what was going on, to scapegoats. But let's take this example of Srebrenica. Mm. Eight thousand young unarmed men were killed, massacred. No, that's false. There were not 8,000 unarmed men. Um, they've only found 2,000 bodies in the region, and not all those bodies are can be identified as belonging to the Muslim forces. Some are quite clearly Serbs who were killed in fighting. What happened in Srebrenica is that the Muslim forces had been attacking, which is a UN safe enclave, which they were supposed to be neutral, but they were using that enclave, protected by Dutch Marines, to attack Serb villages around the area. The Serbs asked them not to do that. They refused, so the Serbs attacked, took Srebrenica, and the Muslim men marched out in a column to try and get to Tuzla. And on the, on the way to Tuzla, there were, there were lots of battles with that column. And most of those men were killed in that, in, uh, in that, those, that fighting including Serbs. So Dutch Marines told me when they were there, there was the, they never saw any massacre of unarmed prisoners, ever. They said it never happened. And we'd be, they were being used as scapegoats, political scapegoats, because they wanted to make it look like the Serbs had done some massacre to discredit them. And it's not true. All of that was... As, as far as I know, from the evidence I've seen, it's not true. Hmm. All the things you're telling me now, but from the time of the 90s, it was President Clinton's term. Mm -hmm. He was of the Democratic Party. He was not George W. Bush. We know uh, he made uh, wars later on in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But that was before. And what you tell me now shows that the United States uh, Army, politics and media uh, for a long time already have some kind of imperialistic uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. So why is that? Oh, well, why? You can ask, that. that's a question which has a very, would take probably a couple of days to answer, really, to understand all the aspects of what drives American imperialism. Um, I'm a socialist, so I see it from material, that sort of perspective. Um, they're the dominant capitalist power in the world. They want to dominate the world's resources and uh, finances. And if they can't do it through peaceful means and bribes, they will use war. And that's what they've been doing since they were founded. Uh, the, the attack on Yugoslavia was, was deliberately to break up. I mean, the, re, the reason the attack on Yugoslavia took place was because Milosevic refused to accept the diktats in, uh, given to him in Rambouillet, France, just a few months before. Madeleine Albright gave him a list of 40 demands. The foreign minister. Yeah, including mm -hmm. the fact that Yugoslavia had to be converted from a socialist to a capitalist society instantly. They had to allow its occupation by native troops. So basically it was, you surrender, we occupy you. 
and he refused. They didn't make us when they began bombing. They wanted to break up the last, after the fall of the Soviet Union, they wanted to break up the last socialist state in Europe. They didn't want it there as an example, the capitalists. They don't want, they don't want that example there. And there were other like economic reasons. They wanted to destroy Yugoslav industry, so because they used to produce their own cars, all the car plants, the Zvastava, Zastava car manufacturing plant was bombed four times. So now they don't make cars anymore. They had to buy Peugeots and Mercedes and, uh, and the Volkswagens from Germany and France. They used to make their own vehicles. So it's like mafioso, we're gonna go in and destroy you and you have to buy us our stuff. That's how it works. Um, and then Bill Clinton, and at the same time as they were attacking Yugoslavia, breaking up Yugoslavia in 1990 through 1999, they also attacked. As soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, they tried to break up Yugoslavia. They destroyed Rwanda at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Congo. And Congo. Mm -hmm. So in the Balkans and in Africa, they were, certain, they were moving already to control the world. The mm -hmm. Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. We don't have to worry about the Russians helping everybody. We're going to do move. We're going to move. And that's what they did. And they're still trying to do it. They keep getting defeated, but they're causing a lot of pain and suffering to everybody around the world doing it. Mm. You know? So. Example, we, we, you and uh, Kosovo, would you have done what Clinton did? Well, I would have done it a little bit differently, and I know this would sound terrible, but look at, look at the havoc that they've wreaked in Kosovo. I mean, we could say we lost very few people. Of course, we had airplanes 75,000 feet up in the air dropping bombs. But look at what we've done to that land and to those people and the deaths that we've caused. Now, they haven't been caused with us and the Allies because we were way up in the air in planes. But at some point, you had to put troops in so not everybody could go over the borders and everything else. And a lot of people agree with that. Now, would people have been killed? Perhaps. Perhaps more. But at least, ultimately, you would have had far fewer deaths and you wouldn't have had the havoc and the terror that you've got right now. So. You know, I don't know if they consider that a success, because I can't consider it a you success. Don't. They bomb the hell out of a country, out of a whole area. Everyone's fleeing in every different way, and nobody knows what's happening. And the deaths are going on by the, by the thousands. How well now we have President that... Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and he promised to change all those things. He promised somehow to say, let's care about American issues only and not involve in any other conflicts of the world. Right. Do you see some hope that it could change? I can always hope. I mean, we all hoped that Hillary Clinton was quite aggressive and, and, and uh, is obviously aggressive. She was, uh, <laughs> was one of those that promoted the attack on the destruction of Libya, for instance. And she made noises that she wanted to attack Iran, attack this country, attack that country. So Russia, yeah, Syria. Yeah, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Trump said in the election campaigns, these wars are necessary, why can't we talk to people? That sounded very good. There was some hope that maybe he would retrench, that America was fed up with these wars, some faction of the business class was, these, don't, these wars don't work, maybe we can try some other way of controlling the world. Okay, but that's not what's happening. He's only been in one month in power, or two months now, and already he's threatening China, already his Tillerson has threatened to attack Korea. I mean, a f nuclear first strike in Korea, he said yesterday. I mean, it's just crazy. They're threatening to, they're sending more troops into Syria, which is going to cause a big war with Syria, maybe Israel and Russia. Uh, they're threatening it again in Ukraine. They're still, now they're threatening Iran again. Everything he said seems to be nonsense. He was just, it's just, he's just a, a what they call in, the, in English a flim flam man, a, a scam artist. He pr says one thing, but says it, but does another thing. He promises one thing, but does another. He promised workers he was going to give them jobs, but now he's taken away all the money from uh, projects which can create jobs to give it to the military. Why are they doing that? They got the biggest military forces in the entire world. Now no, they're going to increase them. So everybody's getting nervous around the world. What do they want? They're going to have nuclear war soon and kill us all. I mean, I don't see any hope now. Um, Maybe he'll surprise us all. I hope something would happen mm -hmm. and I'll be surprised, pleasantly surprised, but I'm not expecting it. I mean, does an American president have the chance to switch everything from one day to the other? I mean, there are ongoing yeah, operations right. from There's the Obama a, time. Yeah, that's, still it's the, quite clear he's surrounded by people who have different ideas and want to push him even more into a more hostile um, way of thinking. There's no doubt that he's surrounded by people in the administration, old administration, in deep government, deep state circles, mm -hmm. of course. But 
let's be honest, if somebody's a really honest person, you're elected as president of the United States and he's the commander in chief of the army, he can say, we're stopping this, we're gonna do something totally different. And if he gets opposition within, why doesn't he have a press conference? You know what, I wanna stop these wars, I wanna do this, but Joe Blow and John Doe and she and he are trying to stop me, they want war. And if I can't do my job, I'm gonna resign. Why doesn't he do that? Or why doesn't he just fire them all? Instantly, you know what? You just fired like all the prosecutors, 50 prosecutors, you just fired them in one day. If he can fire, that's a custom there, but he can fire everybody he doesn't want. Just like that, you're done. And replace them with people who have more peaceful ideas in mind. But they don't, it doesn't happen. So I don't buy this thing that they're surrounded, they're influenced. It's true, there's pressure, maybe they'd assassinate him like Kennedy if he doesn't mm -hmm. go along. Fine. But if he feels that pressured, why doesn't he have a press conference and say, you know what, I'm being pressured, they're threatening me. And I'll tell you who's threatening me by name. So I can't do my job, I, I quit. You guys can have it. Why doesn't he do that? I would if I was the president. If I can't do my job, I tell the people, you know what, they're not letting me do my job you elected me to do. But these guys aren't, they aren't honest people, then I don't believe a word he says. I don't believe anything Clinton would say either. But. The American people, like many of us in the West, are stuck with politicians who really work for other people, not for us. That's it. Thank you very much, Christopher Black in Toronto, Canada, for your time. Well, thank you for uh, coming to see me. What will happen in the future now? Will you have some other job, for example, MH17? Ah, well, that would be interesting if we could get uh, an international public inquiry going, or some sort of tribunal to um, investigate what really happened there. That would be an interesting project to work on. Mm. Mm. Any signs already? Well, we have our letter to Trump demanding that. Uh, I don't think we have a reply yet, but I think we should push that and demand a reply. And then uh, contact other jurists and philosophers and uh, other intellectuals around the world and art and everybody else, artists, everybody who's concerned, and try and push for that. But that's a long process, I think, to uh, organize such a thing. But it's possible. Right. Okay. All You're the best. <laughs> you too. Let's see. Ah, yeah, it's still running. Ah, good.